Someone said that he couldn't do it, but then he does and shocks the whole world who didn't believe that he was somebody and he could achieve and he could succeed. In the same streets that we breathe, we sleep and we cleave to the things we say that we want but don't really need. What happens when all that you wanted is all that you have but not what you need? I want to hold on to something that's real, y'all. I want to hold on to something that's real. I want to hold on to something that's real, y'all. I want to hold on to something that's real. As a young man, I grew up in a community where we didn't wear suits. Matter of fact, all the way through high school, I said I'd never wear a suit. You won't catch me in a monkey suit. That's just not me. If they can't accept me for who I am, then I don't want to be around them anyway. Matter of fact, this attitude that I had towards the status quo and how the system runs was such that I made the decision that I would never step foot into a college classroom. I knew I was too smart. I knew I was too talented. And I knew I was too driven to fail. So this decision never to step foot into a college classroom is what has colored the journey that I am about to take you on, a journey of my life. What I did know is I did know hip hop and I did know I like hip hop and I did know when I performed, people pretty much liked my music. I was one third of a rap group called The Field. We had the opportunity to travel all across the country, small groups, large groups. We were very out of the box. We were so di- we were so different that you might catch us on the corner with a sign saying, we'll rap for food. And we actually did that before. We, we held the sign as a joke, but someone actually invited us. And so we went to a party and ate and rapped there. And that was our payment for performing. But our careers took us to places we never thought we would be. You see, our group grew out of a church group. We were a Christian rap group. But we saw ourselves on MTV. We saw ourselves winning awards. We saw ourselves having our music placed in the international film. So this began to reinforce the point that I was too smart that I was too talented, and that I was too driven to fail. Now, if you count all of the highlights and don't look at any of the low points, I could buy that story, and you probably buy that story too. But the fact of the matter is that I never made enough money to be a full-time hip-hop artist. And so what I did is I continued to work and local nonprofit organizations. And I began to build a skill set that I didn't know was complementary to my hip hop career. So during the day, I'd be working at the Boys and Girls Club. And then in the evening, I'd be at a club or a show or a conference or a concert or a convention somewhere in my city or in another city. As time passed, I began to get the itch to start a business. I knew that I loved the business side of music. I loved the marketing. I loved the advertising. I loved doing the business behind the scenes. And so what I decided was to start my own marketing firm. And in 2005, I opened my doors of my own business with a $1,000 loan from a very good friend. 
I took that thousand dollars. I bought a laptop and I saved the rest for business expenses. Now, my business took a course that was very similar to my hip hop career. I had an opportunity to do things that I never imagined. I had the opportunity to work on the 2008 uh, presidential campaign, something that I had never imagined when I started out. I had the opportunity to represent millionaires. And I'm thinking, as I am sitting across the table from a millionaire, if he knew that I didn't have a degree, would he be talking to me? They didn't know what I didn't have, but they did know what I could do. So this was a good thing on one side, but it was hard living a double standard. Living a life where feeling like if people knew who I really am, would they still accept me the way that they do? Because they know what I can do. Things had, had grown to a point where my business was the biggest purchaser of BT spots, uh, commercial spots in the state of Indiana. So I got flown out to the BT Awards twice. While at the BT Awards, I had some great experiences that still stick with me today. One was my first and only encounter with Mike Tyson. This encounter was an encounter that could change the face that you see right now. You might not see this face if the encounter went a certain way. So it was a friend and myself. We were really thinking about taking pictures with all of the different stars that we saw, Dwayne Wade, Buster Rhymes, a lot of big names, big people. We were all at a party, and we saw Mike Tyson, and my friend was intent on getting a picture with him. And I'm thinking, that's Iron Mike Tyson. You want to leave him? Just, just let him be. He's over to the side. He's eating his food. Nobody is around Mike. That's the first thing that I noticed. And I'm thinking, let's take a note, and let's just be wise about this. And, you know, there's a lot of famous people. Let's go take pictures with them. Uh, but he's like, no, 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 no. Let's get a picture with Mike Tyson. So Mike Tyson is eating his food, and my friend comes up to him, and what Mike Tyson does is he, he makes a sound that is not a part of the English language. He makes a sound like, mm. and he turns, he says, mm. and my friend still continues to go up to him, and I'm playing through my mind. Okay, now, I know Mike sees both of us together, and after he knocks him out, then he's going to come looking for me. And what's my escape route? How, how am I going to get around this? Or how, do I got to do I got to stand up for my friend and get knocked out, too? So this was a great experience. But overall, I'm thinking while I'm at the BET Awards, I'm thinking, man, look at Casey. Came up in the inner city, Casey. Never stepped foot into a college classroom, Casey. Boy, you too smart. You too talented. And you're too, too, too driven to fail. But what I didn't know is that same year, my business would go through what many businesses in America went through during that time. I didn't know that was actually a signal of the beginning of the end for my business. That same year, while in Los Angeles, I received six calls from six different clients. Some of them had signed agreements. Some of them had already given me a verbal agreement that we were going to move forward with the proposals that I submitted. Out of those six clients, six of them canceled. Six of them reneged on our agreements and said, I'm sorry, we just can't do it right now. And six of them gave me no concrete reason as, the, the re, as why they were pulling back and why they didn't want to advertise. So my thoughts were, maybe I'm not so talented. Maybe I'm not so smart. Maybe I'm not driven enough to be able to succeed. And that process was a process that, believe it or not, is the reason why I'm a student of the University of Pennsylvania right now. That year, my family, well, my business brought in $14,000. And if anybody knows business, you understand the amount of money that you bring in is not the amount of money that you bring home. I had a family at that time of three children and my wife. Now I have four children. 
So a family of five, $14,000, you do the math. I was making less than minimum wage for many times putting in 80 hours a week. Where did my smarts, where did that drive, and where did that talent leave me? It got to the point that the day that my wife had my daughter, we had to leave the hospital early to go beg a local charity to help us to stay into our apartment because we received an eviction notice and they wanted us out. That was the most humiliating experience that I could experience because while this person is sitting across from me, she's saying, don't you have a business? She's saying, yeah, I got a business. Well, my husband has a business and he's not here begging. Why are you here? That was an experience that I will never, ever forget. And I really began to think, Where's that smarts? Where's that drive? Where's that talent? And where's it gotten me? All this, and I still was never going to step foot in a college classroom. It got to the point where I began to look for work. And what I learned in my experience in looking for work and having owned and run a business, a once successful business, is that that didn't go far when I began to apply for jobs. I applied for hundreds of jobs and only got a few callbacks. Only a few uh, businesses gave me an opportunity to interview for an opportunity with their organization. And I thought for sure, with the high level of experience that I had, that I'd be a shoe in for a number of positions. When I did get an opportunity to work with the organization, it was a great experience and I loved it, but within six months of being there, I knew that that was not the end for me. In leading a visioning activity with a group of people, I began to ask them questions about, where do you want to be 10 years from now? What would you like your life to be like? What kind of lifestyle would you like to have five years from now? Where do you want to be working? What do you want to be achieving? And as I led this activity, all of the joy just left out of me. And everyone was wondering, Casey, what's, what's going on? What's, what's the matter? What's wrong? The problem that I saw at that point, six months into my dream job, was that I had not done and I was not doing everything that I could to set a foundation for my family. At that point, with no money saved up, no money budgeted, I said, I have to go back to school. And I'm going back. I made the decision, and the very next semester, I was enrolled in a community college. And my only goal in this uh, journey was to make good enough grades that I would not flunk out. And after semester after semester of a 4.0 grade point average, I began to have institutions that were interested in me applying. And that began my journey with higher education. What I've learned through my journey is that yes, success takes talent, yes, Success takes drive. Yes, success takes smarts or intelligence. But the one thing overall that everyone has to have if we are to see success is resilience. I fell down many times. I had many instances in my life where I thought my life is not going where I want it to be the way that I want it to be, and I'm not going where I want to be. This, There was one time in my life that was depicted in a major motion picture. It wasn't meant to be about my life, but yet and still, it was exactly my life. It's, has anyone ever seen the movie Pursuit of Happiness with Will Smith? 
There's a point of his life that he said, this is called running. I keep running, 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 running. I just keep running, 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 running. I just keep running, 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 running. I just keep running, 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 running. It's all over. My rhyme's over. My mind's sober. Now that I'm closer, I see that my shine's over. Now I understand it and see it because I'm older. I let a messed up barber keep tracing my line over. Feeling like I'm naked in middle of times colder. Don't know if I can take it, this burden on my shoulder. I'm learning to embrace it and see that it's my boulder. Even though it's heavy, I need it and I'm over. Chasing success and chasing the wind. Chasing some sex and chasing her friend. Chasing the deal and chasing them ends. Because I know it won't be long before Satan comes in. And I want to come back like Mason again. But I need a love that's replacing the hen. I really need a love that's replacing the sin. I've been in many of places with kings and bums, but the same remains until kingdom comes. Everybody's out here hurting. We all need love. Even successful people, they long for hugs. And yes, I desire Stellas and long for doves. But if that's all that we had, that's all that we was. We keep running. I wrote that piece at a time in my life where I saw a lot of motion, but I did not see a lot of progress. At that point in my life, I looked in the mirror and I saw somebody looking back at me that I did not recognize. It was because I was using all of my energy and I had a lot going on. And many people may have thought it was success. But I didn't have what I didn't have at that time was a firm foundation that I could build from. So my mind state in changing from when I graduated from high school, when I said I would never step foot into a college classroom, to my reality today of being a student and an artist, what has changed for me is understanding that it is not a subtractive process. My process in going to school does not take anything away from me, but it adds a lot more to what I already had. And that, yes, with talent, yes, with smarts, yes, with drive, I have some of those ingredients that I can be successful, but without resilience and the ability to get back up, even after falling, those really don't mean anything. So if I could leave a message with everyone, I would ask everyone to stand up really quick. Everyone stand up. This is an, an activity that I normally do before I say anything. I'm going to ask everybody to clap. You're not clapping for me. You're actually clapping for you. Repeat after me. Say, I. That was kind of weak. Say, I. I. I am somebody. I can succeed. One more time. I. I. I am somebody. I can succeed. You can have a seat. In closing, the one thing that I've learned, I used to do that as a young person in a summer group every time we met. And that has led me through some very, very dark times because there will be a point in your life where you don't have people around you that are telling you, you are going to be successful. You are going to make it. And at that time, you have to be the one who says, I, I am somebody. I can succeed. Thank you very much.